Queen Elizabeth's Platinum Jubilee celebration. We break down all the big events, the big surprises, and how the Queen is feeling after her historical weekend. I think the Queen was very happy by the way it went, the statement she released also, of course, included very importantly uh, her uh, continuation of her pledge to serve, supported by her family. Prince Louis steals the show as Kate and William step out as a family over the celebratory weekend. Yeah, like, do, do you think Kate was having fun or something like that? I was like, no, I think she was pretty stressed. Plus, Harry and Meghan make their royal return and give us a glimpse at Lilibet. How are they feeling? What was their interactions with the family? Well, we've got all the details. From that standpoint, it was an unmitigated disaster. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to see how the royal family could have been any more callous uh, toward the Sussexes. And we've got that plus so much more in today's Royally Us. Hello to our fellow royal lovers and welcome to Royally Us. I'm Christina, that is Christine, and we are coming off a, an historical <laughs> weekend of the Platinum Jubilee. Christine, I know you were there on the ground. Must have been so much fun. It was incredible. I think the most, there were so many amazing things to take in, but what I loved was that everybody was so joyful and so happy to be there. Even if you weren't a huge royalist or a big monarchist, you were still so happy to take part in these celebrations. It was amazing. It was amazing. And you got the front row seat to the Troop in the Color. That must have been so cool seeing everything kind of unfold right before your eyes. I did. I was. I had really, really good prime seating for all of Trooping and the balcony appearance and the fly past. It was amazing to be to like witness that moment in history to see all the royals in person although they were quite far away and quite tiny it still counts <laughs> could you see um, little and i felt yeah i know i shared as much as i could on my instagram but i really feel like you you know I, there was no way to capture what an amazing atmosphere it was yeah could you see little louis reactions from where you were sitting <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually could see him when I was in such a good spot that we were one of the first people to sort of spot that the children were in the carriage and you could almost hear like these <gasps> as like as they went around the the Vic Queen Victoria um, Memorial and I was sort of the first one I was like I think I think Louis in there and everyone's like no no there's no way and I'm like no I'm pretty sure <laughs> so it was so much fun to see I mean he really stole the show oh, 100% we're going to talk more about that um, a little bit later on but let's get to all of the big events I mean following like you said the Trooping of the Color the Queen did announce that she would be missing several events due to discomfort and that included uh, the Thanksgiving event at St. Paul's Cathedral the Platinum Party and the Epson Derby um, but the, the royal family really stepped up up and represented um, and attended all of these amazing events at St. Paul's, the Platinum Party, the Jubilee Pageant. It was really, it was really a sense of togetherness, it felt like. Yes, I know. I'm listening to you list off all these events, and there really was so much going on, including, you know, um, the Cambridge is going to Wales, the Wessex is going to Northern Ireland. I mean, there are people everywhere, you know, representing the, the Queen and the Royal family. Um, and it really was a family affair. You know, that's why we saw the kids as much as we did, not just George, Charlotte and Louis, but um, Zara Tyndall's children, Peter Phillips, little girls. Uh, it really was, you know, even we saw so much of um, Princess Eugenie's son, August, and it was just, it was a family affair, really out in full support of the Queen. And it was just so, so, sweet to see. It really was. We saw um, Prince uh, George and Princess Charlotte uh, joining an orchestra um, perform who performed yeah. in canto. Um, they sang along to Sweet Caroline at the party at the palace. Um, and of course, the Queen did make an appearance alongside Paddington Bear. So take a look at this. I love this. It kind of um, reminded me of like the Daniel Craig moment um, when, you know, that viral moment before the Olympics. So I love when she kind of gets in on the joke a little bit. It was so, it, yes, I love that it showed even after all this time, she has the ability to surprise us. She has a great sense of humor. Um, and I just loved that they had her tapping her teacup along to the intro of the Queen song. I mean, that was just iconic and just so cool. I loved it. I loved it. And of course, the, just the lighting and the 
photographs that they had um, lighting up Buckingham Palace. I mean, they really did an extraordinary job putting on this concert. And um, not only did it take a trip down memory lane, it, you know, commemorated the Queen in such a beautiful and fun way. And there was also so many heartfelt moments that night, too. Prince William made a passionate and heartwarming speech at the party at the palace and paid tribute to his extraordinary uh, to the Queen's extraordinary reign and made a little joke about it. So take a look. While no one's grandmother thanks them for talking about their age, my own grandmother has been alive for nearly a century. I, yes, it's so nice. I mean, he, and he also took the time um, during his speech to, of course, talk about climate change, which is something that is very important to him. Yeah, they're always really thinking about, you know, the, the causes that they're working on and the projects that they're working on. But, you know, he is so funny. He does know better than to joke about a woman's age, but <laughs> it was it was very sweet. <laughs> it really was sweet. And speaking of sweet, Prince Charles um, delivered a deeply personal tribute to his mummy, the queen. Take a look. Mm. Your Majesty. Mummy. <laughs> the scale of this evening's celebration and the outpouring of warmth and affection over this whole Jubilee weekend is our way of saying thank you. Thank you from your family, the country, the Commonwealth, in fact, the whole world. I love that. I love it. He did get a little chuckle when he was like, the queen, my mummy. Like, I love that so mummy. much. You, you, you tend to <laughs> it forget. It was really sweet. Yeah. And I love that he said that the, all of this was really a way for his their family to say thank you and for the people to say thank you, for the Commonwealth to say thank you. Mm -hmm. That was really an important underlying theme was all of this was to say thank you to the queen for her service. I thought that was really moving. It really was. And he also um, paid tribute to his um, late papa, Prince Philip, and said that he would have absolutely loved being there as well. And you saw these beautiful images of the two of them um, lighting up Buckingham Palace. And I mean, I, I'm sure the queen watching from home was definitely moved and touched by all of these um, amazing tributes throughout the entire weekend. And she did release a statement saying, I have been inspired by the kindness, joy, and kinship that has been so evident in recent days. And I hope this renewed sense of togetherness will be felt for many years to come. I thank you sincerely for your good wishes and for the part that you have played in these happy celebrations. Of course, she did make a surprise appearance at, on the Buckingham Palace balcony alongside Prince Charles, Camilla, and the Cambridges um, to culminate the Jubilee celebrations. And I think that this was such a pivotal and important moment for so many people to show that she is, you know, strong and um, she is vibrant and as she is um, there thanking everybody uh, in person, which I thought was really important. Yeah, I felt that that second balcony appearance, you know, at the end of the weekend was really moving. Again, just to see her um, out in one of her iconic, you know, bright green ensembles surrounded by her family. It was really, it was moving. It was very moving to see her. It really was. So we wanted to know how the Queen was feeling following the celebration. So we checked in with royal expert and historian Richard Fitzwilliams, who was also on the ground. And he broke all that down, including what is going to happen next. Take a look. Well, now that the Jubilee weekend is behind us. I mean, how does the queen feel about going forward? And then, you know, like you said, this transition of power, how do you think that she is feeling about this? Well, I think that she will do as much as she can. And I mean, she can do quite a lot virtually. She can give audiences mm -hmm. and um, she will attend the, any events that she's able to attend. And of course, that is this um, more of the situation where we don't know until the day. And indeed, we didn't know until the Royal Standard went up over Buckingham Palace mm -hmm. uh, whether she would appear in that glorious emerald mm -hmm. green yeah. at the end of the, um, of the weekend. But Obviously, she'll do what she can. And also, she always said, I must be seen to be believed, and that's what she believes. But the mobility issues are clearly concerning. So uh, Charles will be doing more and will be backed up by the members of the royal family, of course. And we've seen, as I say, it was good, very, very good that we saw the 18 working royals on the balcony. Mm -hmm. And also that the Queen has expressed the wish that Camilla be Queen Consort right. when Charles ascends the throne. To have done that uh, in um, just before her, uh, the Jubilee 
commenced, I was absolutely pivotal because it, it is not terribly popular, never has been in polls, but people recognize that Charles and Camilla are uh, a perfect match. And it's a long, you know, the unhappy past is a long time ago. Mm-hmm. But had that been left, you could have had the situation where it would have been announced. Now, obviously, that was when Charles ascended the throne, but we know what follows thereafter immediately. But subsequent to that, mm-hmm. in the months before the coronation, that could have surfaced. And it's one of those things you want solved. And the Queen, again, has done wonders of this of this decision. Yeah, I mean, like he said, it's going to be like this. I mean, it has been a transition of power over the past uh, few years, months. Um, so I think we will continue to, to see that. And the Queen will be popping up to events where she feels like she is able to. Yeah, and I think we've talked about that, that it's a sort of slow um, transition really to prepare the public for what comes next. Yeah, definitely. All right, well, now it is time to spill some royalty. And a lot of people were anxiously awaiting Harry and Meghan's big return to the UK. The couple did step out for the Thanksgiving service, which had them publicly reuniting with the royal family for the first time since 2020. We checked in with body language expert Elaine Swan to give us an insight as to how the couple may have been feeling during the outing. How do you think they seemed? What was kind of the vibe that you were getting from them? You know, the, the, the thing with Harry and Meghan that I love is that they really, truly lean on one another for that equal support. And Harry's just so gracious, so uh, attentive to his wife. You can tell there were gestures and holding her hand, uh, giving her little glances to let her know that he's there for, for one another. And they certainly had this united front with one another. And it's very clear that in this, as far as the dynamic is concerned for this family, it really is them uh, together collectively and then also the monarchy and the the working royals in the family there's definitely a divide as far as it's concerned but i believe behind the scenes you know there this is still a family this is still a family and they're going to tread through these waters in the best way that they can but they certainly put on the bravest face that they could and move forward with their focus being, we're here to celebrate this Jubilee and focus on this and not necessarily lean too much into the rift that the the rest of the family members might have. So I think they did a pretty good job. Yeah, no, and you know, they were the, you know, people over in the UK aren't big fans of Harry and Meghan and they made it known that they are not big fans of Harry and Meghan. They were met by booze by the crowd when they entered the church. I mean, for me, that would bother me, but it seemed like you said they were kind of leaning on each other and they kind of maybe toned that out a little bit. They did. I feel like they leaned on each other and they understood the purpose. And this is one of the things that I often share is that when you have a goal in mind and you have something specific in mind, focus on that and not all of the exterior things. Mm -hmm. So this is exactly what they did. They, They went there, they, they did what they were supposed to do and sat where they were supposed to sit, whether it was on the other side of the aisle or not, you could see them still, you know, looking at each other and glancing and smiling and so forth. And they said, you know what? This is a moment in time. We're going to get on the other side of this and live the rest of their lives because what they do have is a very, very warm welcome reception back here in the U.S. You know, we have reporting that they had a little party for Lilibet that the Queen attended. So she was able to have that one-on-one time with her great-granddaughter. So I think it sends a powerful statement that they attended the Jubilee. Um, and, you know, maybe that this is a, a step forward into healing that rift. I think it is. And, you know, I still saw some unification, in my opinion, because if you think about Jubilee's past, I I was looking at what the women were wearing. And if you notice uh, Kate and Megan in the last Jubilee, they had jewel tones. It was as if that was the memo of the day. And just to look at what they were wearing this time, it seems like there was a memo that was sent out and the family had a a, a particular look and, and they were right in step with this yeah. Megan and Kate. We're still in step, I think, with that memo of the attire for the day. So that's my little secret thing that I think uh, says that there's a lot more going on behind the scenes than we think. I love that. I think that's so interesting because, you know, they're all they were all in those like pale, neutral tones. And, you know, I wonder, you know, it kind of, you know, blends in with the crowd a little bit more and, you know, was able to kind of let the queen shine. Yes. And that was that was certainly the memo of the day. And if they were so ousted the way folks want them to be, we wouldn't have seen that in Megan. So I think there's a lot more unification that we see. That's my opinion. I love how she made this uh, that uh, statement about how 
she feels like they're more united than people may think because Megan was kind of in on the whole theme about how to dress. So she, I don't know. It was an interesting take on, you know, maybe they are closer than we may think. We will never know, but we can always <laughs> speculate, which is what a lot of people do. And I know a source told us weekly that Harry and, May Harry and Meghan could have gone to the party at the palace, but decided to keep a low pro profile on Lilith Beth's birthday and celebrate in private. I mean, do you feel like they chose to kind of take a back seat and let the queen kind of shine um, on this weekend and not make themselves the headline. Yeah, I think so. I think that's really what, what we saw here was them sort of laying low, taking a back seat um, because it avoids any kind of, if, if we don't see them, there's no story to tell whether it's good or bad, you know, stealing the spotlight from the queen or not. It's sort of, if we don't see them, then we know that the story stays on the queen and on the, you know, what really matters in this weekend. I think that was really purposeful. And again, like you said, I even feel like her outfit, you know, working with everyone else's outfits, but also being sort of a very neutral beige tone. It was very different from the green Amelia Wick Instead, we saw last time she was at, I mean, she's at Westminster Abbey, right. but that bright look at me color versus this was very subdued, very, um, you know, it, it, it not, you know, not a look at me sort of ensemble. So I think that there was a lot of planning here to make sure that the queen was a star of the show. Yeah, no, and you, you make a good point that she kind of blended in with the crowd. And this was the first time that we kind of saw Harry and Meghan with the royal family, but not sitting with their immediate family. You know, they were, you know, sitting with Eugenine and, you know, the other grandchildren because they are not senior members of the royal family anymore. And that's their place now. And I wonder, you know, we'll never know, but how that must have felt for Harry. It must, it must have been a strange thing for him, I would imagine. Yeah, it was like that was the first visual reminder that we yeah. had of their change in not really in rank, but sort of in their, you know, social standing within the royal family. They're not working members of the royal family now. So they sort of sit with the other non-working members of the royal family or sort of, you know, the lesser important, um, you know, lesser high ranking members, which is interesting because Harry still is what fifth in line. Yes. Uh, I'm like counting one, two, three, four, six in line to the line. throne. Mm -hmm. um, so he still does rank quite high, you know, in terms of the um, succession, but in his role in the royal family, he's sort of off to the side now. Yeah, no, it's so true. Well, the couple's daughter, uh, Lilibet, did celebrate her first birthday with the royal family uh, during the Jubilee weekend, and they released an adorable photo of Lilibet. <laughs> we finally get to see her red hair and all, and the couple had a very small private party at Frogmore Cottage. I mean, this photo, she is like Harry's twin. <laughs> she's, she's a little Prince Harry. It's so cute. I've loved the people pulling up pictures of Prince Harry and even Princess Beatrice mm -hmm. with that beautiful sort of Windsor red hair. Um, she really just is such a cute little girl. It was such a darling photo. And I love that she just looks just like her dad. <laughs> just like her dad. I was hoping that we'd get a, a sneak peek at Archie as well, but uh, a photo of Lilibet will have to do. <laughs> and, you know, there were reports that um, she did meet her great grandmother, the queen. A source told us weekly that Harry and Meghan visited the queen at Windsor Castle with Lilibet and Archie. And uh, they added after reluctantly pulling out of party at the palace, spending time with her great grandchildren and seeing Lilibet turn one added some light to her day. She thinks they're adorable and gave Lily and Archie gifts. So I think this, this was probably something that was really important to Harry and Meghan. It was to introduce uh, Lilibet to her namesake. Yes, absolutely. I'm sure it was really important to them. And it's so hard, you know, when I think about how the pandemic affected our family, not being able to introduce the babies to the older family members is hard because there's always that unease that time is running out. So I think this was probably extra, extra special for Harry and Meghan. Definitely. Um, well, we wanted to know how Harry and Meghan are feeling after the return. Did they spend time with William and Kate? Well, we checked in with royal expert and author Christopher Anderson, who helped us break it all down. Take a look. And I mean, how do you think the Queen is feeling following these amazing uh, Jubilee celebrations? Well, elated and exhausted. You know, I mean, from the standpoint of uh, spectacle, it was a glorious celebration of the Queen as a person and of the monarchy, you know. Uh, and it went off without a hitch. I'm sure she's relieved at that. But I have to say, oh, the whole world was watching, waiting for to see if, uh, you know, if fences would be mended, if the mm -hmm. Sussexes would get back, uh, you know, together with the rest of the family. And it, from that standpoint, it was an unmitigated disaster. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to see how the royal family could have been any more callous uh, toward the Sussexes 
I mean, they, they literally, you know, they were meticulously, uh, you know, choreographed in every instance to be sidelined and marginalized. Um, so I, I think if, you know, if Henry went, if Harry went to uh, London uh, to the Jubilee celebrations, hoping to mend fences, uh, you know, uh, that didn't happen. I mean, nobody was saying somebody else. As a matter of fact, uh, they literally turned their back on him at St. Paul's Cathedral, as the whole world saw. And I just think it was it was all done in a very kind of cold and uh, somewhat heartless way. You know, going back to Harry and Meghan, how do you think that they were feeling before going to the Jubilee, and how do you feel they were feeling after? I think they were hopeful. And I think that, uh, you know, they went there hoping to mend fences and ran into a brick wall. Uh, when, you, when you see, uh, well, for example, we now know that the Queen... Well, the men in gray who really handle things uh, would not permit uh, the Queen's photograph to be taken with a uh, little bit. You know that 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 spoke volumes. I think it was a really bitter pill for for um, Meghan and Harry to swallow. Got to remember, uh, Archie was photographed with the Queen when he and Prince Philip and Doria Ragland, uh, you know Meghan's mom, when he was two days old. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's tradition to be photographed with the uh, with the monarch when you're a, a grandchild or a great grandchild, and uh, so this was a very different feeling. Um, William and Kate made no effort at all to introduce uh, George, Charlotte, and Louis to their cousin, which I thought was because they could have. I guess they went to Wales at one point uh, during uh, during the first birthday party of uh, Lily, but uh, they could have made room in during that schedule to see them, and they. Uh, as far as I know, nobody believes they spoke. You know, mm -hmm. there were moments in, at the cathedral where it looked as if Megan was kind of turning away from Kate when Kate walked by. A lot of tension. And I think what it boils down to is not only what's happened in the recent past with Megxit and with the Oprah interview and all of that, but the royal family is terrified about what's going to be contained in that book that Harry is going to be publishing at the end of this year. And so one can imagine that they're thinking, well, you know, why make nice now when mm -hmm. in a matter of months we may all be skewered, you know? So that's understandable as well. But it's sad. It's very, very sad, I think. You know, we saw some reports that um, Meghan and Harry were seen leaving Charles's home. Is there any truth to that? Do we know what they talked about? Um, and maybe, you know, did it move us towards healing any of these rifts? Well, I understand that it was a perfunctory meeting uh, that... You know, there was no uh, real breakthrough. And I have a feeling that um, Harry was hoping for it. Harry definitely went there hoping for some sort of rapprochement and he wasn't getting any, there were no touchy-feely vibes coming back in his direction. So I think that the, the curtain has come down. And, I, you know, one of the things I think is so sad about this is that, you know, Diana, were she alive today, would be heartbroken by this because she always saw Harry as, he, she would have understood why Harry wanted to make his own life, why Harry would go to California, but she always saw Harry as, you know, Charles, as uh, William's wingman, you know, she, she always said, my boys are my revenge, and I, and I think, and what she meant by that was that as a team, they would go forward and carry the monarchy forward in, 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 into a more modern era, um, but now, uh, you know, it looks like it's just going to be uh, William and Kate and the kids. Do we know if William and Harry spoke at all or if Kate and Meghan spoke at all? All the information I'm getting is that they did not, that they did not speak, that they did not meet, um, that it was uh, a pretty frosty reception that they were getting there. Do you think he ever regrets taking that step back? You know, I, I would say that he's digging in. I think if anything, this kind of treatment at their hands uh, just makes him more determined to, to, to live a separate life. I mm -hmm. mean, it, would anyone have regret? Yes, he, I'm sure he would have liked to have had things go more smoothly, and perhaps he would have liked to have had um, the family react in a less uh, belligerent way, but there you are. All right, well, let's check in on our favorite part of the Jubilee weekend, and we have to talk about um, the kids. You know, uh, <laughs> Prince Louis became a viral sensation, and it seemed like Kate and William were in on the joke. They tweeted, we all had an incredible time, especially Louis with the uh, wide-eye emoji. Uh, the post also included a photo of the young royal standing next to his dad at the Trooping the Color. But, oh, my God, does he have a personality? 
He is such a four-year-old little boy. I mean, I just, I think everyone with a, with a child that's like three, four, like in that age range, boy, did we relate to Kate over this weekend. I, someone asked me, yeah, like, do, do you think Kate was having fun or something like that? And I was like, no, I think she was pretty stressed. <laughs> I think she was super stressed. There's like a video going around, of course, you know, of uh, Louis sticking out his tongue, covering his mom's mouth, um, you know, and she did her best to put it all together. And I just loved at the end of the clip, she just flips her hair and she's like, I am done with this. <laughs> when he gets home, he's in trouble. <laughs> it's so royals they're just like us they, they really know, are but i mean four-year-olds I mean, are so strong will <laughs> they are and they, i mean you have to you have to remember it was a long time for him just sitting in the seat and you know he was probably a little bored <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah but, when you see the footage a lot of the kids that by that point are kind of getting up walking around you know visiting other family members because it was a long pageant for young children to be sitting you know, sort of trying to sit still. So I, it was, I loved, loved seeing them. And I thought it was so much fun just to see them being normal kids. Exactly. No, definitely. Like you said, Royals, they're just like us. And what an amazing Jubilee weekend. We've been talking about it for months. It finally happened and it definitely lived up to all expectations. Absolutely. It was right. such a historic, memorable weekend. Definitely. Well, Christine, thank you so much for breaking it all down. I hope you get some rest. Um, it's, been, it's been quite the journey. It has been such a long weekend. I'm ready for some downtime, but I suspect that that won't happen. And we'll no. be busy with lots to talk about next week as well. Of, of course. Well, guys, keep commenting, to keep subscribing. We would love to know your favorite moments from the Jubilee. So please let us know in the comments below and we will see you guys next week. Bye. Hey everyone, I'm Christina Garibaldi, the host of Us Weekly Celebrity Coverage. Don't forget to hit subscribe for the latest celebrity news, tips, and video. And for much more content, make sure you head on over to usmagazine.com, the official home of Us Weekly Magazine.